Right now it is time for the Media Beat with David Terachuk. David joins us on a Friday morning. We rebroadcast it over the course of the weekend and also after our noon news on Monday. Uh, David has his own website, uh, themediabeat.us. He's also a PBS television correspondent reporting on ethics and belief. And we'd love to welcome him in on a Friday morning. Good morning, David. Good morning, and it's good to be with you reporting in, as usual, as most often at least, from the media capital of the world, New York City, where today we are bracing ourselves rather like you are in northern Connecticut for uh, gusts of winds up to 50 miles an hour. <laughs> it's not a usual thing here. I don't suppose it's all that usual where you are, too, but uh, uh, the weather is very peculiar these days. Uh, we've had our share of wind this year, and of course, you're, you're not only the media capital of the world, but the opening up media capital of the world in in, uh, in July. Oh, the summer of New York City is what our mayor is proclaiming it will be. Yes, uh, hoping to uh, open up in uh, in June. Uh, now, exactly what opening up means is still a little unclear. And, and don't forget, of course, uh, this city is constantly uh, beset by the rivalry, though particularly with the two individuals involved. Uh, it's especially strong at the moment. The, ri the traditional rivalry between the New York City mayor and the New York State governor, uh, it's not entirely uh, up to the to the mayor himself to declare the city uh, fully open as many things including crucially of course the city's transportation system is under the control of the mayor so and uh, with these particular individuals occupying the office uh, the two offices at the moment uh, you'll, you'll very rarely get them to agree anyway so it's um, it's a bold statement uh, that the mayor has made uh, but whether the governor comes on board with that same date for opening up uh, is extremely unclear at the moment. The, the governor, of course, has other problems besides uh, COVID, though you think <laughs> the COVID would be the most important thing in his life, but at the moment he's fighting for his political survival in the face of uh, sexual <clears throat> harassment claims and also um, a great doubt cast over what was previously a sort of heroic image almost that he was enjoying for his handling of COVID. Uh, accusations abound and uh, continue and are being investigated that he, that he uh, covered up uh, the truth, the, uh, the the very unhappy truth of uh, of deaths among uh, uh, <clears throat> old people's homes uh, residents. Uh, he tried to allegedly he tried to keep the fact from the uh, from the from the population as a whole that uh, the, these numbers were were bad, and he didn't want the, that fact to uh, interfere with his. Sterling, uh, developing sterling relationship, uh, re reputation at the time. Uh, so he's he's got a lot on his plate. Uh, but whether or not New York City uh, figures largely in his thinking uh, is uh, not not certain. But I would imagine that that uh, rivalry, the political rivalry, we're talking about, uh, has just not gone away in his mind. Uh, he's capable of uh, bearing grudges, as indeed is the, is the city's mayor. Uh, uh, even in the face of uh, other much more important things going on. I wonder how Andrew Yang's going to get along with Cuomo. <laughs> <laughs> well, Andrew Yang is running for mayor, yeah. uh, but uh, he's not had a very good campaign so far. Uh -huh. um, and uh, uh, he, although, you know, he, he made a remarkable, it, he had a remarkable impact for a, a, an individual with no party backing uh, when he was hoping to get the Democratic nomination for the presidency. Um, but he's uh, bouncing back. Uh, attempting to bounce back uh, after, of course, not winning that nomination, uh, and, and hoping to to um, figure as um, the city's next mayor. But uh, his 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 campaign is not exactly going uh, with with any great uh, pizzazz at all. He seems to be struggling. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so do uh, do we do we uh, play our our call to the post here now for you? Yes, we do. Let's hear the fanfare. There's the, 
as our fanfare, it goes to um, not a journalist this time, but a mathematician. <laughs> uh, I want to apologize for mistaking the, um, the, the mathematics involved in, in counting our president's first hundred days. I said last week it was going to be uh, happening, uh, the hundredth day would be happening on the, uh, on, on the Tuesday of this, of this week. Of course, I got it totally wrong. It was the th- I was mixing up my Thursdays and Tuesdays. The hundredth day was the was the Thursday, uh, and we now have had President Biden in office for a hundred days. So uh, <clears throat> I'm not someone to consult on mathematical matters normally. I'm just not reliable in that area. Uh, but I, I admire mathematicians who crisply and clearly uh, express themselves. And in this case, uh, the, the very good piece of journalism doesn't come from a journalist, but from an academic, an academic in mathematics and economics. Uh, called Dr. Zoe McLaren, who is occupying uh, a slot and providing us with a piece of journalism a journal, <clears throat> in, in a slot that has traditionally been called, called the op-ed until this week. Uh, now, the op-ed dates way back to 1970 uh, with the New York Times creating it. And, of course, uh, although people uh, don't always understand this to be the origin of the phrase, it just it all, all it means is the position in the newspaper that such a column occupies. It's op-ed in the sense that it's opposite the editorial page. Uh, it's come to mean, I think, uh, uh, anything that expresses an opinion. And, and, and if people think at all about the, the op part of it, they assume that it's somehow in, in opposition to what the newspaper itself in its editorials uh, it believes. Uh, but that's not the case. It's just a matter of the geographical placing, which now is sort of so, uh, in a way, so irrelevant to our considerations when we look at journalism now, since uh, the print newspaper is not where most of us uh, anymore see it. Uh, <clears throat> we've no idea whether it's opposite a, a, um, a newspaper formal editorial in the printed paper because we're looking at it online. So the New York Times has stopped calling these uh, pieces of journalism um, op-eds and is now calling them a guest essay. And Dr. McLaren's guest essay uh, <clears throat> is all about how you, um, how you calculate the numbers when, when a, when a an, ap- a, 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 an epidemic or a pandemic is increasing or declining. And she explained so wonderfully clearly, and this is why I, I think it's worth uh, fanfaring, uh, explained so clearly how uh, the vaccination program that we've been rolling out can reduce the speed of COVID-19's transmission. Um, and uh, just, uh, perhaps just, to, just as importantly, uh, how vaccination as it rolls out can uh, almost have the opposite effect of um, of the spread it, it, it is literally the opposite effect of, of a camp of a pandemic spreading uh, she demonstrates in ways that, are, that I find utterly comprehensible and that's not always the case when it comes to mathematics I did give you that warning uh, the, the, the case that that, that we talk about um, a, a, a form of uh, I'm getting, less, I'm getting lost even in the terms because they don't come naturally to me. Uh, but when, when you talk about a, a, uh, a spread, uh, then you need to know about how to stop a spread. And, and her mathematical explanation of it is, is so clear. The end of a pandemic, she says, and this is, the, this is the paragraph that I will cherish, the end of a pandemic will therefore probably look like this. It will look like a steep drop in cases followed by a much longer period of low numbers of cases, although cases will rise again if people ease up on precautions too soon. And that, that uh, caveat that she sticks on there is of such great importance, as we're learning so clearly in, uh, in the practical rolling out of the vaccine and, and the, the numbers as they are actually happening in this country anyway. Uh, there's a 
the precautions even have to be maintained, even what, that's the mask wearing, of course, and the social distancing and hand washing and all of that must continue, even though uh, the, the, the numbers of us who have been vaccinated fully are going up. Um, and and, uh, and that's a, a real, <coughs> a really important public piece of uh, public service. And to have it explained in ways that I can't do it so well, I refer to to, to you on a, April 28th in the New York Times guest essay area. Uh, you'll find Dr. McLaren's perfect explanation of why this is all the case, and she's a and she brings to bear her economics background to to health policies, uh, looking in particular at the way uh, specific diseases uh, spread and are contained, such as HIV, uh, tuberculosis, and COVID. COVID-19. She makes it makes really, really good expert reading, uh, expert reading that is very clear to a lay audience, even a lay audience member like me. All right. So that is our fanfare for today. Uh, On to some pretty horrible news. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go, go to both Israel and uh, and India, India first, uh, uh, with their total uh, uh, devastation from this uh, wave of COVID-19. Uh, we have a show host here who joins us once a month, Arjun Singh from Jaisalmer, and uh, he's just been talking about it. It's so bad, the hospitals, his mother is battling cancer, uh, and they had to go to her house to administer her treatment because she could not get into the hospital. Uh, India is just in an amazing crisis right now. Yes, uh, reports from India are, are so terribly disheartening and dispiriting. It, it's uh, uh, and, and so horribly ironic too. When India has such a, an astonishing reputation in the world as as the manufacturer, the, world, the world's leading manufacturer of vaccines, it's a it's a particular medical manufacturing market that they have cornered uh, very effectively. Uh, but now, they're now in the terrible position of having to import vaccines from overseas. In fact, they're just taking um, delivery now of uh, the Russian uh, vaccine called Sputnik. Uh, and, and yes, it's, it, it is horrific. Uh, and of course, it, it, it all boils down to that same point that uh, uh, the mathematician Dr. McLaren was pointing out, that if you don't have transmission stopped uh, by the, the physical means of uh, uh, of masks and social distancing and hand washing and so on you you are you are like very likely in fact it you know, proven so absolutely horribly so in india you are very likely to get um, a continuing transmission in india's case much worse transmissioning overtaking every other effort to get any control uh, on the disease and, and and the essential reason for that is the sheer populousness of, of india uh, <clears throat> of, of it, the 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 cities of India, as anyone who's been there, are, are, are something of a uh, of a of a horror show to uh, to experience firsthand if you're not used to them. Uh, the sense of personal space is almost non-existent in uh, in an urban uh, Indian environment, uh, and of course it's very hard, very very hard to get any kind of control on a disease that gets as rampant as it has in India. And it's not just India, too. Brazil is is now suffering um, uh, horrific increases, too. It, it, its uh, death numbers uh, overtook uh, in, in overall total uh, the United States this week. And uh, and the similarities of, of approach um, in the two countries are, it's, it's sad to say, very similar, too, uh, helping to uh, reinforce the, the, the horrible uh, rampage of the disease. Uh, in each case, you have what is called a, uh, I, I'm never sure of the, the value of this term, um, a populist leader, um, President Modi in um, in India and uh, Bolsonaro in, in Brazil, uh, both somewhat uh, slapdash uh, in their uh, approach to controlling the disease. In fact, control is, is, is not really what they've been about. Modi has been right up until very, very recently been holding massive, massive political rallies. Uh, both of these men, of course, uh, have 
uh, been remarked upon as, as, as modeling themselves to some large degree in ex-President Trump. And in Bos- Bolsonaro has been doing the same too. And even as the numbers ramp up uh, of, of deaths and, and the spread of the disease in his country, he is uh, urging, he's, he's cheering on those uh, regional and local governments in his country who are opening up uh, and, uh, and, of course, making transmission all that more dangerous and, and, uh, uh, <clears throat> and in their case, uh, just, uh, you know, contributing to the situation getting worse and worse. But, of course, the overall um, worldwide picture at the moment, while, while America seems to be getting a grip on it all, and, and we're all, many or many of us at least, looking forward to uh, what seems to be light at the end of our terrible tunnel. Uh, in India, it's far from that. And uh, there's, there's a great deal of, of, of uh, and why wouldn't there be uh, a great deal of panic about the matter entirely? Uh, stories coming out of India now are, j- are just just horrible and horrific. Um, with, with people running out, with uh, hospitals running out of, um, of oxygen uh, and, and uh, terrible disputes bring, uh, breaking out about who gets oxygen and who doesn't. It's uh, it's the most horrific form of, 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 a, of a disease taking hold of a country, and uh, and, the, and the reporting that's coming out of it has, has been a, been a powerful material to read and, and very very distressing, of course. You know, and it's in a relation to that. We'll go to Israel, which last year uh, canceled one of its biggest religious festivals, and this year they decided to hold it uh, not for two days, but for one day. But a hundred thousand people uh, showed up, and uh, then there was what inevitably happens: uh, just that huge crush of humanity on top of one another. Uh, a minimum right now, 44 people dead, another 40 injured, and uh, 150 other people uh, in serious condition. Uh, just being called in Israel uh, one of the worst uh, uh, public death disasters uh, outside of war. Yes, again, it's uh, it's the very opposite of social distancing, and in this case, it's, <coughs> the, the disaster that's been reaped is not uh, of, uh, of an infectious nature, but <coughs> that, that strange phenomenon that happens in very big crowds, sometimes panic, and, and even sometimes the, the, the physical closeness of bodies to each other is fatal in itself. All it took in this case, it appears, is, is, uh, is some people slipping uh, on, on uh, uneven territory. Maybe it was steps a set of steps and, and, and people falling back on each other and, and ca- causing what, in a way, you could see as a, as a kind of human avalanche. And, uh, and yes, it's, a, it's the worst kind of, uh, of, 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 of fl- <coughs> death being inflicted upon by human beings or other human beings, totally inadvertently, <coughs> unintentionally, uh, but fatal nonetheless. And, uh, and it's uh, it's one of those stories that you just shake your head at and think, how could how could such a, a mass of individuals be allowed to to gather? Uh, but again, uh, people's sense of priorities when it comes to matters like um, uh, pilgrimages and and the devotion uh, is often greatly at odds with uh, what many of us would call common sense. Uh, but it's happened, uh, and uh, and as you say, steps were taken to prevent that, well, to, to ban that, that event from taking place at all last year. Uh, and uh, this year, when it has taken place, it's resulted in these terrible deaths. Uh, it, it's uh, it's an intriguing question as to whether it will happen uh, next year. I suspect not. Now, I, I only watched clips of uh, of uh, Joe Biden's, uh, President Biden's uh, State of the Union address after 100 days. Uh, I, I, I turned off media coverage of it because, like I said, uh, I don't need people, six people around a table telling me what they just heard. Uh, Whoever does. <laughs> yes. on, on, the, on the other hand, we keep being provided with it again and again and again. It seems to be the formula now. 
but, but it was uh, it was to me the most historic thing was right off the bat to see two women sitting behind uh, the president of the United States, uh, uh, of course the Speaker of the House and a Vice President now, both women. Well, absolutely. I mean, to be able to say, uh, Madam uh, Speaker and. Uh, uh, and Madam Vice President, uh, as the President sitting, standing rather, addressing a joint session of uh, both houses of Congress, uh, is a remarkable thing. And of course, <coughs> Biden himself, <coughs> excuse me, Biden himself made that very, very clear. Uh, and yes, historic moment. Um, and, uh, you know, lo uh, long overdue. <laughs> uh, there's, there's no doubt about it. So uh, he, he plowed on for an hour in the, in the slightly constrained circumstances of a, of a very far from full chamber. Uh, with social distancing being observed, of course, uh, but there was still uh, there was still an echo, a kind of faint echo, of uh, what these uh, joint sessions can be when the president speaks to them, um, and it's a little late in his administration to be doing it, but he used it to mark the, the very imminent hundredth day. Of course, he was speaking on the ninety ninth day. Uh, and, and because of the thinned out nature of the audience, uh, we were all wondering whether we'd get uh, anything like the echoes of the old uh, roaring of applause in particular and the standing up uh, of people who support him and the resolute sitting down, of course, of those who don't support him. And that still went on. You still got uh, uh, his talk interrupted uh, many times over by at least Democrats applauding. Few, uh, a few uh, Republicans now and again. But the whole thing was somewhat muted in, the, in that sort of um, uh, auditory barometer, if you like, of, uh, of the president's uh, welcome or unwelcome uh, words to uh, whichever side is expressing that welcome or lack of welcome. And uh, you, you, had a, you had a sense of, of uh, still being a divided house, of course, a house divided, they say, or Lincoln said, never stands. Uh, but we've got a divided government very clearly. And uh, the, the, uh, the Democrat hold on the two houses is uh, razor thin in the case of the Senate, and not exactly firm uh, in, in the House. So what uh, you, you face with, uh, with Biden at the moment, and, and all editorial coverage of, of this is, is, is reflective of it now, uh, that Biden may, be, may have campaigned on the grounds of being a very bipartisan-minded leader and that he would govern, he said, with bipartisanship uh, very much to the fore in his approach. Uh, but, it, but in the actual practicality of it all, uh, he is uh, he is rolling out an extraordinarily um, well impactful if if it all gets put into place uh, all the sections of it uh, a remarkably uh, ambitious agenda. Uh, and breaking it down, I suppose, simply as, as he does oftentimes into uh, the American jobs plan and the American families plan. Um, as he spent a lot of time saying uh, in this address, uh, he's, uh, he's in practical terms uh, going to be doing this with only one side of the political equation fully engaged. Uh, it will be in a, a democratic agenda being rolled through as, as firmly as he can, uh, and, and, and often, uh, you know, perforce uh, without uh, Republican support at all. Bipartisanship is not going to be a feature uh, of all the legislation that he wants to get pushed through. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, commentators are still scratching their heads, really, uh, saying, is this the Joe Biden that we know? Uh, but in fact, <clears throat> this is the Joe Biden that we know. He knows how to get things through uh, his long time in, uh, in, in, uh, in, as a member of Congress himself. Uh, has shown him how to get things through, even when the mathematics don't actually favor him too well. And I suspect we're going to see that from now on. Uh, <clears throat> these will be Democrat proposals, uh, wide, widely ha 
failed on the Democratic side as uh, every bit as important as anything uh, FDR did in the uh, you know in in, in, in the tackling the the aftermath of the depression and uh, after, <clears throat> and during World War II uh, with a smack a firm of a smack of uh, firm government and uh, and uh, very much a democrat uh, agenda democratic agenda and the uh, the idea of all of this massive social change being uh, uh, implemented by this president uh, without uh, the support of the other side of the aisle uh, is kind of mind boggling for those people who still think of uh, Biden as being a, a, an apostle of, of bipartisanship. And then you had the Republican response by uh, the only black member of the uh, Republican Senate, and that was Tim Scott, uh, came on and uh, and did a 50 minutes response to uh, uh, Joe Biden's address. Yes, indeed. And he pointed out that he's been accused uh, in, in, uh, in his political career of being an Uncle Tom. And then we had, of course, the inevitable onslaught on Twitter, <clears throat> where everyone was indeed calling him an Uncle Tom uh, for the positions that he took, uh, uh, fir firmly declaring, by the way, that America is not a racist country. Um, well, there's <clears throat> quite how you define what a racist country as a whole is is, is not, not an easy thing to do. But clearly he was... Uh, he was taking uh, a set of uh, Republican talking points and then putting his own personal stamp on them as a black person who, as he said, has suffered himself uh, from racism. Uh, and uh, it, it, it got to the point where his, um, the, 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 the attack on him on Twitter, his own sort of, uh, uh, his, his own transformation into a, into a target for abuse, on Twitter meant that that whole topic area had to be shut down. Uh, again, you know, it's a, it's an indication of uh, of uh, of the extremes that we've gotten to uh, in in this country, where you know, civilized debate is 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 often impossible, and um, it, it's an indication, I think, of uh, of the. Of, of the overheated temperature of the times, and it'll be very interesting to see if, if such uh, su such division um, and uh, partisanship can be uh, the basis on which a, a major social uh, transformation is achieved, as uh, Biden wants to achieve it. He's, he's going to have to railroad through an awful lot of contentiousness. Well, you know, sometimes people just, you can't please people. Uh, I have a lot of conservative friends that wrote about uh, about his response. And I said, uh, I posted, uh, I was glad to see it. And a lot of them came back at me saying, well, are you being sarcastic? And I said, no, just roll, uh, just roll any speech given by President Trump. Uh, before this, and then roll Mr. Scott speaking after after this. I much prefer <laughs> the oratory uh, presence of, uh, of 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 how he did it. Uh, I don't agree with a lot of the things Tim Scott said, but uh, it wasn't it, it was not anywhere like uh, like seeing Donald Trump uh, respond to anything. So uh, I just think people have got to step back on their heels and, and uh, just try. Uh, and the media as well, instead of being immediately critical, just try to present these people and, and let it go from there. That's a hopeful thing to look to look for, um, uh, an appeal for coolness uh, in our political, the temperature of our political debate is, uh, is very welcome. David, we'll speak to you next week. Have a great weekend. Absolutely. Take care. Bye now. Uh, that is the Media Beat with David Tarachuk here on Robin Hood Radio. Uh, you can find David on demand, robinhoodradio.com. Click on On Demand. Click on the Media Beat with David Tarachuk. You can also find him at his own website, themediabeat.us.